Thank you, in the virtual. Thank you, Google. And thank you for coming. And um, it's always a pleasure to be in Amsterdam. <clears throat> thanks to Paul. Thanks to Leah for booking the hotel. Thank you for the four-poster bed and taking all the red M&Ms out of Robin's bowl of M&Ms. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm, I'm basically Robin's warm-up act. And tonight is... Uh, a particularly geeky night because usually he and I talk about web standards but today we're actually talking more meta than that we're talking about how standards actually get made so if that isn't interesting to you go away um, if that is interesting to you and it is more interesting than it sounds I promise let's go it's called uh, Bruce's Tour of the Sausage Factory because Otto von Bismarck, the ex-chancellor of Germany, was alleged to have said, but he didn't actually say, the less men know of the making of laws and sausages, the better they sleep at night. <coughs> There's a misconception that standards are made by the greatest, mind in the in greatest minds in the industry sitting down, having rational discussion, and coming out with the best solution, agreeing on it, and implementing it. Robin may tell you later on that this isn't a perfect picture of the process. Um, sausages is a good analogy, because sausages are actually like this. This was my Christmas dinner on the Burmese Thai border five years ago. This is cow placenta soup. It's not as nice as it sounds. Um, <coughs> But sausages, of course, are basically like politicians, mostly lips and assholes, but nevertheless made to look attractive. And this is how standards are made. It's actually uh, a grim, bloodthirsty process full of hatred, tears, laughter, sex, and violence. So if you're already, if you're not of a nervous disposition, let's look. So I, I got thinking about the sausage metaphor, and sausages are a metaphor for standards in this talk. And I don't know this talk very well, so if I go wrong, please uh, forgive me. <coughs> but I got looking at these things. This is called suicide food, and you've all seen this. You've all seen billboards or advertising where things, creatures, eat themselves to ent entice you to eat in a restaurant. So I was looking for a picture of a sausage, but a happy sausage, ready and a lovely sausage that was made properly and enticing <coughs> you to eat. However, if you do a Google image search for happy sausage <laughs> <laughs> with safe search off, you will you would be surprised at what you would find, frankly. So I couldn't use that image, but instead I had my daughter. It was summer holiday. She's doing art. She was going to ask me for some money anyway. So I said, draw me some sausages. And that's the metaphor for this evening. So you all think that sausages, standards, are made by the best minds, etc. It's not the case. The Economist wrote in 93, the noisiest of competitive battles between <coughs> suppliers will be about standards. In the computer industry, new standards can be the source of enormous wealth or the death of corporate empires. With so much at stake, standards arouse violent passions. We can see this. This is December the 10th, 1908, in Buffalo, New York. <clears throat> and it's the first thing I could find that actually talked about how standards were made. The player piano manufacturers gathered together in 1908 to standardise piano rolls. These are piano rolls. They're large pieces of perforated paper with holes in them that indicate each note. And the width of the hole indicates the pressure of the note to be played. And you could buy a piano, plug this in, and then listen to the piece being performed. And it was actually like MIDI, but 100 years ago. Uh, they, could, they had special recording pianos, so there are rolls that are recorded of Rachmaninoff and Scott Joplin and great pianists playing their own compositions, and people would gather around and listen to a player piano that would play this stuff. And the trouble was, is different manufacturers had different standards for the roles. They considered this to be a competitive advantage. 
if I have a Rachmaninoff recording and it's on my special format, you can only listen to it on my piano. But consumers complained. So in 1908, on December the 10th, the manufacturers got together to solve the problem of the scale to be used for 88 note players. Some people wanted six perforations per inch, other people wanted nine perforations per inch. And there were addresses by various representatives who argued that their position is the correct one. What's interesting here is that this is a hundred years ago and we can still see the same positions used by different companies today. So, Mr. Pletcher of the Meville Clark Piano Company said that he believed six inches per six perforations per inch was the best, but he said that his company would abide by whatever the meeting agreed with. Mr. Hale spoke at great length on the subject, according to the newspaper report. I, I think we all understand what that means. But he offered data. They counted up how many compositions they had that needed a certain amount of rolls and offered this to the meeting. Mr. Voti pointed out that the nine perforations per inch was better played with a special mechanism that his company had invented and they said they hadn't patented this mechanism and would not patent it and they would offer it to any manufacturer patent free as long as they adopted nine perforations per inch. Mr. Kludge, and you'll never hear this said in Web Standard, said the nine inch per scale had been adopted by their company and they were not willing to change it. This is an attitude that you never hear these days in, in Web Standards. Eventually, they came to agreement, nine perforations per inch, leaving a margin each side for future development, which is very for thinking of them. And Mr. J.H. Dickinson suggested the player piano and the piano roll manufacturers present might affect a permanent organisation for meeting and discussing such questions. But the story of standardisation goes back even further. To Victorian times, this is an, uh, a woodcut engraving of the first railway coach. It was horse-drawn, but it was on tracks. And those tracks were a specific width apart. And they were a specific width apart because people who made horse-drawn stagecoaches had factories and equipment already set to make that particular width apart. And that's called the standard gauge, four feet, eight and a half inches that 60% of the world adopts. <clears throat> There's no intrinsic reason why four foot eight and a half inches is better. It's just what everybody agreed on. And in the UK and countries that don't border on another nation, that doesn't matter. However, when railways became widespread, different countries adopted different gauges because the gauge didn't matter in and of itself. It didn't matter as long as everybody agreed on it. And here, on the Russian-Ukraine border, where they had different gauges, what they would have to do is take all the passengers and all the goods off one carriage, take the wheels off and put it on this trolley, and then it would continue on its way. Obviously, this causes great difficulty. It's time-consuming and, as we all know, time is money. This was problematic. In the American Civil War, the South all the southern states all use different gauges and this caused them considerable difficulty in moving soldiers and armaments around. After the Civil War, it became a major economic nuisance and the northern states pressurised the southern states to convert. In two days, two days, they dug up all of the railway tracks in the southern states and they changed all of the carriages and the whole of the US was standardised. But you can't dig up old websites and change them. You can't dig up old browsers and change them. Those things are set. This could be done. It was a massive undertaking, but it could be done. You can't do this with the web. But the same principle holds true. The UK government said in a report, 
Open standards gives us interoperable software, information and data in government and will reduce costs exactly the same as standardising the train gauge, exactly the same as standardising the piano roll gauge. Standardisation reduces costs and gives the consumer more choice. The medium's different, but the message is the same. Anybody do a computer science degree? Anybody know what these are? <laughs> Horses asses. Thank you, Wilfred. I knew there was a, a serious guru in our midst. <laughs> <coughs> the reason the Romans had chosen... The Romans, by the way, this isn't me, this is the Roman sausage. <laughs> the rail gauge was actually based upon the width of a Roman chariot. And the Romans would drive along the muddy roads in the UK and their chariot wheels would leave dent marks in the mud. And then the next chariot would go along those same dent marks and then chariots were always made at the same width. Then the factories were equipped to manufacture stagecoaches to that width and that got standardized purely because the Roman chariot is the same width as two horses asses. Four foot eight and a half inches is the width of two horses asses. Tangentially if you were making Roman chariots today they would be wider because horses are getting <laughs> fatter. In fact when I was researching this as you do I looked at the uh, a veterinary website and apparently there is a killer disease quietly spreading through the horse population of the United Kingdom and that disease is obesity, ladies and gentlemen. I blame the fast food manufacturers for uh, targeting the horse population with their so-called hapy meals. <laughs> <Thank you. clears throat> Some standards didn't really get made at all. They were casual standards. Here you can see uh, <coughs> a hipster like Thomas on his skateboard with his cool <laughs> hair, casually skateboarding along a bike lane. <coughs> An example of this, for example, is the spelling of referrer, the misspelling of referrer. In a hundred years time, HTTP will be running somewhere and this accidental misspelling in an email will be there forever because one guy spelt it wrong. Another example are the CSS colours that first appeared in Mosaic and Netscape Navigator. Then they got uh, standardised and then they got moved into CSS and SVG but nobody knows who compiled the initial list. But you can't change them because they're in the standards everywhere. Now, I don't know who compiled the list, but I'd be willing to guess that whoever it was went on to work in the porn industry and went on to be the person who chose the names for the models. Because if you look at those, <laughs> any one of those could be the name of a porn star. In fact, would anybody like to tell me which one is not a CSS colour? It's a lavish prize. The last one. No, the last one. They are all CSS colours. <laughs> <laughs> Would anybody like to tell me which of these is not a CSS colour? Peach Puff. Misty Rose. Misty Rose, Peach Puff. Actually, the CSS colour is blue violet. Violet blue is an erotic blogger <laughs> specialising in oral sex. But interestingly, the erotic blogger Violet Blue sued. Ada Mae Johnson, who was appearing in adult movies under the name Violet Blue. Ada Mae Johnson lost the case and now performs as No Name Jane. So there you are, you've learned something. Other standards travel through time. They are retrospectively standardised. Things that were never standards, but implemented widely, were standardised much later. Examples are XML HTTP request. XHR powers most of what we used to call Web 2.0. But this was made up by Microsoft in IE 5.5 and only standardised by the Netherlands' own Anna van Kesteren about six years ago as part of the HTML5 effort. 
This stuff powered all of the web, but how it worked was never written down until Anna van Kesteren did the legwork and retrospectively standardised it. Same with content editable. That was invented by Microsoft and then implemented everywhere and so became part of the HTML5 standard by retrospective standardization. Same with the embed element. That was never part of a standard until HTML5. It worked everywhere, but it was never part of the standard. Quirks mode is still being standardized by Simon Peters, my brave but clinically insane colleague from Opera. <laughs> Canvas was also retrospectively standardized, and I want to focus on that, because that got, that's got some good uh, lessons to learn about standardization. In the HTML5 spec, it says special thanks to Richard Williamson for creating the first implementation of Canvas in Safari, from which the Canvas feature was designed. That last clause, from which the Canvas feature was designed, is telling. Initially, oh, by the way, any idiot can get their name in the HTML5 spec, look at that. <laughs> Initially, yeah, yeah, but you're not talking, so shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you're the star, mate, you can shine later. Uh, the path to proper, proper standardisation of Canvas wasn't smooth. Because Apple didn't write down how they made it. They just made it. So Ian Hickson had to reverse engineer it. And reverse engineering basically means you throw all kinds of crazy tests at the API and try to work out what the hell is going on. The trouble is with reverse engineering is that unless you are a genius like Van Kesteren or Hixie, it's very easy to draw the wrong conclusions. So Apple implemented it, Opera and Mozilla copied it with a difference and Chrome copied it and Hixie reverse engineered it and that meant that when our friends in Redmond decided to implement it in IE9 they didn't need to spend thousands of man hours reverse engineering it they just looked at the spec and implemented what that said and bang you're good to go reverse engineering is a bullshit way to implement features this is a word I'm not allowed to say, and the reason I'm not allowed to say it is because if you infringe this in the US, you pay damages. If it could be shown in the US that you knew this existed, you pay three, time the three times the damages. So I'm not even allowed to say the word. But I interviewed Hixie a few years ago, and I said, what's the biggest danger to the free and open web at the moment? And he said, that word <laughs> that I'm not allowed to say. A little while ago, on the WhatWG HTML5 list, dear WhatWG and Mr. Hickson, if anybody calls Hixie Mr. Hickson, you know the rest of the email is going to be pretty hard. Apple Computer Inc., Apple, believes it has intellectual property rights, IP rights, relative to what WG's web application's 1.0 draft, entitled Graphics, the Bitmap Canvas. At this time, Apple reserves all rights in its IP rights and makes no representation as to Apple's willingness or unwillingness to license those rights. However, in the event that the web application's 1.0 working draft becomes part of a formalised draft of W3C or IETF, for example, Apple is prepared to address the disclosure licensing rules of such organisations. Therefore, Apple pushed the WhatWG into going to W3C in order that the on canvas not be infringed. Patent, oh, shit. that word can kill open standards. Because I'd like to give a shout out to my daughter, because I said, can you draw the letter P murdering a sausage? And she went, yeah, yeah, no problem. So, yeah, 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 look at that, that's great. Another thing that um, wasn't in, yeah, it's all open source. One of the things that uh, we changed about Canvas at Mozilla and Opera 
is Canvas was originally implemented like the image tag. It didn't have a closing tag. But the thing is with, with tags that don't close is obviously you can't have anything inside them. So when we implemented Canvas, we made it an opening Canvas tag and a closing Canvas tag. Because then you can have stuff in the middle. So now, in browsers that support it, notably Internet Explorer, you can have stuff inside the canvas element, which isn't shown because the bitmap image is shown, but that stuff can take keyboard focus so that people who can't see the image, because, for example, they're using a screen reader, can still interact, interact with it. That's why closing tags are really important in modern standards. We see this with HTML5 video. In browsers that know what video is, that stuff is ignored. In browsers that don't know what video is, that stuff is shown. That means you can have real fallback. If it was like the image element that doesn't have a closing tag, all, the only fallback you can have is an attribute, the alt attribute. And because it's an attribute, you can't style it with CSS. You can't have any rich markup. Inside the video element, you can have a link, you can have an image, you can have whatever the hell you like. And we, when I, me, when I invented the picture element in 2011, I used this as a model so that you have source elements that control what responsive image is shown, but this image element is for full of that content. Cleverer people than me told me this was nonsense. But that's what my model was. Uh, as a brief aside, some people ask me, why is it picture and not pick? Because T-U-R-E in an opening and closing tag, by God, that's an extra eight bytes and performance matters. So if you had a thousand picture elements, that would be a whole 8K wasted, squandered, thrown away in your page. The real reason, and this is a world scoop, you are the only people who know this, is the picture element was, I kind of dreamed it up, and Matt Marquis also dreamed it up um, at the same time, but we didn't know each other. Then Tab Atkins from Google helped specify it. Simon Peters from Opera helped specify it. Marcus Caceres from Mozilla helped specify it. And Yoel Rice, who works for Akamai, wrote the C++ code that goes in WebKit and in Blink. And, of course, this is an open standard. You can use it, but the first time you use it, you need to buy a picture of beer for each of us, and that's why it's <laughs> called the picture tag. <laughs> XHTML2, they understood the importance of closing elements. So XHTML2 redefined the image element to have a closing tag, and then fallback content went in the middle. The trouble is with this, is that in any browser, if you try this, if you type this in and try it in any browser, old or modern, you will see the image and you will see the fallback content. Because this is a good idea, and this is how it should have been done, but the trouble is, it doesn't matter how much of a good idea it is, it doesn't matter whether this is the way it should have been done, it wasn't done like this, and it doesn't work in browsers now. And that's important. Just because something is a better idea doesn't mean it's a good idea if it doesn't work in browsers now. XHTML2 died. Basically, the W3C <coughs> tried hard. Uh, it got drunk at a party, fell in with some bad XML people, woke up with its nose in an ashtray and its trousers around its ankles <laughs> with a terrible hangover and thought, shit, what have I done? And they abandoned XHTML2. This is an example of a formal standard that went nowhere. And the reason it went nowhere, as a brilliant thinker, me apparently, I, I remember that some guy had said these words, XHTML2 was a beautiful specification of philosophical purity that had absolutely no resemblance to the real world. So I Googled to find the quote, 
and found it, and it was a journalist quoting me, and I'd completely forgotten I'd said it. <laughs> but I thought, wow, a brief moment of lucidity in all of these years, and I'd forgotten it. Isn't that bizarre? Timbo, or Sir Tim Berners-Lee, as you call him, he said the reason that the, X, the HTML2 generating public didn't move to XHTML2 was because the browsers didn't complain. Now, I love Timbo, except when he comes around to my house and throws up on the carpet. But I still love him anyway. But he's being a little bit uh, revisionist about history here. It's not that the browsers didn't complain, it's that the public would have complained. HTML5 doesn't try to support old browsers. HTML5 tries to support old content. There are precisely, and I've counted, 419 Brazilian websites out there, approximately. And it would be intolerable if browsers couldn't show that content. So HTML5 tries to support old content. And by doing that, you have to care about old browsers. But caring about old browsers is a byproduct of making sure that all of those web pages written 10, 20 years ago are still available to us all today. Because that is part of our digital heritage. That is part of our worldwide knowledge. And it should never be lost. Hmm, Bacon. Anybody know this guy? Don't have Charlotte's Web here in the Netherlands. <coughs> this pig in Charlotte's Web, the children's book, is called Wilbur. And this is a pathetic way for me to segue into a discussion about HTML 3.2, which was codenamed Wilbur. This is a long time ago, but this is kind of when I started to get interested in web standards. If you look at the HTML 3.2 spec, and I wouldn't advise it if you care. It says at the top, relative to HTML2, HTML3.2 adds widely deployed features such as tables, applets, text flow around images, superscripts, and subscripts. This is like HTML5, but a decade before, 10 years before. It standardizes stuff that is already widely deployed. But when I read this, relative to HTML2, HTML3.2, blah, 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 I thought, whatever happened then to HTML3? HTML3 <coughs> was a proposal for extending HTML, for HTML in 95. But the difference between HTML2 and 3 was so large that standardization and deployment of the whole proved <coughs> unwieldy. And the HTML3 draft expired and is not being maintained. This is exactly like the battle between HTML5 and XHTML2, but instead of being in 2005, it was in 1995. As a boring tangent, HTML3, which never came about, supported these following kinds of form fields, range controls, and scribble on image. Now, when I read this, because I'm a massively boring geek with no life at all, I thought, what the hell is scribble on image? <laughs> so this took me hours because I, had, I found it in a zip file that I downloaded from the W3C. But scribble on image allowed the user to scribble with a pointing device on top of a predefined image and then sent a bitmap field back to the server. What a vital piece of technology that we missed out there. <laughs> <laughs> Lobby, the nearest W3C person you know, for scribble on image in HTML6, or tell him to get the fuck out. Here's an example of the difference between modern standards and HTML3. This is HTML3. It had a fig element for figures and a caption element to caption the figure, and a credit element to credit the figure. All very sensible. But if you look at it, any browser that was made before HTML3 
wouldn't show that image because browsers, if they don't know what an element means, they ignore every attribute. So any browser that existed, had HTML3 ever come about, would not have shown the image. It wasn't backwards compatible. The caption element, at the moment, you can only use inside a table. And the reason for that is that we tried to use the caption element for other stuff in HTML5, but in old browsers, the DOM goes mad if you try and use the caption element outside a table. Don't ask me why, it just does. And you can't even work out in what way it will go mad. It just goes mad. So they had specified this, but they'd never actually checked what would happen to the DOM inside existing browsers. The credit element is a good idea, and one day we will have one, I have no doubt. This is the equivalent in HTML5. You have a figure, but it wraps stuff. The image is shown on an image element. So any browser that doesn't know what figure means will still show that image because it knows what the image element is. We don't have caption because it would make the DOM go mad. So the new element, fig caption. And instead of inventing a new element called credit, we redefine small to mean small print, attributions, copyright notices, etc. That's the difference. If you're going to pave some cow paths, pave the damn cow path. Don't just invent a new way. That's why HTML3 failed. That's why XHTML2 failed. So HTML3.2, widely deployed rendering attributes are included where they are shown to be interoperable, just like HTML5. Such as little things like the script and style elements, which you've probably heard of and may even use in some of your projects. So HTML3, that never happened, is another example of a sausage that everybody shunned. Implementers weren't interested, and they gave up specifying it. Another example of a shunned standard <laughs> is app cache. If HTML5 elements had a party, that would be web workers, that would be web sockets, that would be event source, that would be canvas, and the one sitting on its own, snogging nobody, getting sadly drunk on little cider, would be Jake Archibald. It would be App Cash. <laughs> Pixie himself, oh, sorry, Alex Russell, sinister mastermind at Google, said the problem with App Cash is it's declarative. You give the browser a manifest and magic happens. And this has well-documented limitations. Hixie said, the app cache API is another big mistake. It's the best example of not understanding the problem before designing a solution. And I'm still trying to fix that mess. The people who edit specs are brilliant at editing specs. But they don't necessarily make websites. So App Cache was a great example of somebody solving a problem. And what App Cache does, it does OK. But the problem it solves isn't the problem that people who actually make websites face. That was the major error there. App Cache is a douchebag, said Jake. And we need to fix it. And we came up, in the end, with service worker. Look at the cat. Look into the cat's eyes. Listen to my voice. Use opera. <laughs> OK, wake up. I'm still going to keep that on there, which is getting hot in here. I promised you some, some high fashion. So service workers are interesting for many reasons. They solve problems. Service workers allow things to be offline by default. It forces you to have URLs because modern web apps platforms don't do URLs very well. And URLs are a central part of the web. If you boil down the web in a big saucepan all weekend and 
got rid of all the scum, all the pictures of kittens, all the YouTube comments, all the Facebook. What you would be left with at the bottom of the pattern, after boiling the web from Friday until Monday morning, would be links. That's why it's the web. And URLs are too important to the web ever to disappear. App cache, uh, <laughs> service workers is difficult to explain. It's best done with an analogy. Analogy, is that a word that you guys know? Okay. So, your web app <laughs> is this lunar module. The walrus with a fish is the user, and the fish is the task that she wants to accomplish. The network is represented by this leg with a lampshade on the top. <laughs> we all know that you can't get a walrus into a lunar module. <coughs> this is a shit analogy. <laughs> this is code. So, this is how you do a service worker. Simple bit of JavaScript. You register the service worker. Your service worker is just a bit of JavaScript and therefore will live in the browser cache and therefore is available to you even if you're offline. The next time that your user goes to this page, the service worker is registered and the service worker takes control over all requests to the network. Requests for images, requests for scripts, requests for... Uh, video, even links, which means you can do anything you like. Currently, this is the internet, it's a series of tubes, as we all know. If the <laughs> network is broken, your browser will give a message saying something like, sorry. When you have a service worker, it sits between the web and the browser. And if you, as a developer, have taken the trouble to populate the database, could be an index database, could be the special new cache that's given to you with Service Worker, if you've taken the trouble to populate it with content, any request to the network that fails and gives you a status code of failure, you can then drag stuff out of the database, feed it back to the browser, and the user never need know that he or she is offline. And the example of this, for example, is like a webmail client. If you're offline on a plane, obviously you can't send or receive emails because you have no network. But you can, if you can use it offline, you can still draft emails, you can still delete emails, you can still put emails into folders. You can do all that kind of work. Previously, you couldn't do this on the web with Service Worker in Opera and Chrome and very soon Firefox. You'll be able to use your web pages offline. But there's no magic. You as a developer have to write the JavaScript. It gives you loads of power, but you have to do it yourself. And this is a good thing, unless, like me, you hate JavaScript. But then I know people who are clever at JavaScript, and I can beat them up to write the script for me. It gives you loads of power. We give you the small stuff, like the ability to intercept uh, network requests and you've already got index database, and then you can do with that what you want. AppCache didn't let this happen. So, for example, Jake Archibald has this fine example. Basically, this is a service worker that, if it's a Thursday, will ignore any request for an image across the network and just show you a picture of a kitten. It's not a particularly useful example, but it's an example of the power that you get. And the reason that service workers are only available over HTTPS is precisely because of this. Anybody can inject scripts into your page. We've seen with, uh, in the States with Wi-Fi providers injecting advertisements into pages with scripts. If somebody can inject a script into your page that hijacks any network request, that would be intolerable. And that's why service workers are only available over a secure connection. This is an example of what, in my opinion, is the next phase of web standards. The extensible sausage. Another example of a search term that you would be best not to type <laughs> into image search, by the way. The extensible web. Ask a friend. Um, <laughs> AppCache taught us a great lesson. People waited for years for, for AppCache to be spec'd. 
And then you waited for a couple of years for it to be implemented before you said, but we don't like this. This is shit. Well, you maybe, didn't, you maybe said it more nicely than that, but that was the message that we got. So the idea is that we give you, or we expose, small bits of the platform that you can script. And then we can see what you do with it when, once there is a, a corpus or a canon of best practice established, then it can be baked natively into standards. This is, in a very shallow nutshell, what the extensible web is. And Robin is going to tell you all about it later. I'm really excited to hear that because I know the philosophy but not the actual mechanics of it. The Extensible Web Manifesto, which is signed by many people who are on the W3C Technical Architecture Group, although it's not an official W3C tag uh, spec, says, browser vendors should provide new low-level capabilities that expose the possibilities of the underlying platform as closely as possible and then seed discussion of high-level APIs through JavaScript implementations. But let you guys experiment first and work out what you want to do and the best way to do it before we build that stuff natively in C++ in the browsers. Because we know how to write specs and we know how to build browsers, but you know how to build websites. So somebody said on a mailing list, why? Are standards so slow? Some guy called Mark Roberts, no idea who he is. Why is everything around us developing so fast but the web is so, sl so slow to adopt anything? Hixie said, to put it on the web, have someone design the feature, have someone spec it, have somebody write the tests, have one browser implement it, and another browser, and another browser, and another browser, and have it documented. Everywhere else, someone implements it. Of course it's slower on the web, but what you get on the web is what we love about the web, reach, the ability to run everywhere. We need to find a way to get new features to you faster, but in a way that you can make use of without us trying to guess what you want. We've seen this before, geolocation. Years ago, if you wanted to access the GPS, the, the positioning chip on your device, you had to use a native app. Then the W3C got together with, who was it, Nokia, Vodafone? Everyone except Nokia. Everyone except Nokia. Sorry, we're recorded. Uh, with a bunch of people. With a bunch of people <laughs> and opera, co-chairing, I need to say that because they pay me to be here. And we came up with the geolocation API. And more and more, the slogan, there's an, app, there's an app for that, can be replaced with there's an API for that. We have the file API that allows you to open files in the browser. Orientation, sensors, web R2C for video conferencing, drag and drop, etc. Not every native API will be made into the standards unless Robin has a working group hard at work on the rectum API, can you comment? Hard is the word for it. Hard at work. But most of the things that everybody needs are being standardized now, the device APIs. And this is important because if you leave technology in the hands of one company, you're at the mercy of that company. Even if you believe that the companies that are currently on top are beneficent, wonderful people who have the web's best interest at heart. 88% of the companies from 1955 on the Fortune 500 are bankrupt, merged, or still exist, but are tiny. You can never leave something as important as the web in the hands of one company. It needs to be open standards, but they need to be made in a better, more clever way. The newest kid on the block is Web Components and his trusty sidekick, Shadow Dom. I made this logo because I like designers to be enthused about uh, specifications. Web Components is an anagram of spec, own, and tomb, but that's probably a coincidence. They allow you to modularize. They allow you a high degree, but not complete encapsulation. There are some things that break encapsulation still, and I don't think those are going to be fixed. 
It allows you to share stuff. It allows web software to be built like other software has been built for years. You can extend existing HTML elements. So for example, you can make a cool button with a video behind it, but you can say button is equals fancy button. Things that understand web components will get your cool button with a video behind it. Things that don't understand web components will just get a good old fashioned HTML button and it will still work. Progressive enhancement is built in. If you explore web components, do this. Don't make new components. Also, if you do this, all the behavior of a button in browsers, like you can focus it with the keyboard, like you can activate it with a spacebar, all of this will be inherited without you having to write extra code for it. Take advantage of what's given to you for free and build on top. The Extensible Web Manifesto says, in order for the open web to compete with world competitors, there must be a clear path for good ideas by web developers to become part of the infrastructure. We must enable web developers to build the future web. And this, ladies and gentlemen of the Netherlands, is the virtuous, angelic future of web standards. How can you participate? There's a thing on the W3C called Specification Forum. Deliberate typo there from Robin. Uh, if you go there with an idea, use cases are always better than your favorite syntax. Say what problem you want to solve, not wouldn't it be lovely if there were a pineapple element in HTML. Read and use Mozilla's Web API design guidelines before proposing something, but have a look and propose something. Robin will tell you more about the mechanism by which you can really and genuinely get involved. The standards need you, so work with us. Thanks very much for your time.